Amen. If you have your Bibles today and you would join me in Matthew the 25th chapter, beginning at verse 14, Matthew the 25th chapter, beginning at verse 14. It's a little bit long, the passage. We're going to read between uh, verses 14 and verse 30. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid my talent, thy talent, in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Will you bow your heads with me one more moment? King Jesus, Lord, we love you and we thank you, God, for the word of the Lord. We thank you for the opportunity today to receive a message from heaven that would inspire our hearts, encourage our souls, and cause our faith to grow and prosper. We need, as the minister of the gospel, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need the touch of your hand. 
And Lord, everyone that would hear, everyone that would listen to this message, both now live, those who will watch later by reason of the internet, they need a touch from heaven, which allows the word of God to reach into the innermost part of their heart, help them to understand and receive that which they hear, and help them to know, God, that this is not the ramblings of a man, but it is a word from the Lord. Help us, Master, today, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I'm talking to us today on the topic of great expectations. Great expectations. Many believers today stand convinced that the Bible is a book of rule. It's a book of laws and mandates, edicts and commands. It is not. But that's how so many view it. On the other hand, there are those Christians or those who identify as Christians who read the Bible as though it only vaguely has any application for them at all. The reality today is that the truth is actually somewhere in the middle. The ultimate end of God's Word is not to beat us into submission or beat us into obedience. You know, there are parents in this life who their whole objective is to get their kids to obey them. And then there are parents in this life whose whole objective is to get their kids to love them. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. And now you can go too far in either direction. You can either go so far trying to help your kids to love you that you never correct them, that you never scold them, you know, that you never hold them accountable. And that's not a good thing either because then they grow up and they turn into horrible people. And they're not the kind of people anybody wants to deal with. But parents who want their children to be able to love them also understand that there are those times when you have to correct your child. There are those times you have to punish a child. There are those times you have to hold your child accountable, am I telling the truth? And But it, there's a balance to be struck. Well, the same is true of the Word of God and understanding the Word of God. The Word of God does not exist to beat you into submission. The Word of God exists to help us to know God so that we might love God. In Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 30, the word of the Lord reads, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, meaning asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? Now, mind you, the scribe is a Jewish expert on Judaic law, on the Old Testament law. You have to understand, God gave the law to Israel. Israel was not only, an, not only was Israel a people in terms of uh, nationality and identity, Israel is both a nation and a religion. Okay? They were a people of one faith, they were a people, but they, but they also were a nation, and therefore God gave them the law, and the law was meant to serve as a civic law, as a secular law, as well as, as a religious law. So it served a dual purpose. This man is an expert on the Jewish law, and he comes to the Lord, he said, what is the first commandment? What's the most important commandment of all of them? Verse 29, Mark 12. And Jesus answered him, listen, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Notice how Jesus started with that phrase. There, there's no commandment in there. But he started, you know why? Because every time a Jew prays, that's how they begin. They literally begin by saying that, uh, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one 
Lord. He said, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Well, that doesn't sound like somebody who's trying to beat me into submission. Sounds like somebody who wants to be loved. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. So the most important commandment according to Jesus is love God. Love Him. Don't just love Him a little, but love Him a lot. Now I'm going to tell you something. God don't ask you to love Him a lot and then give you a little reason to do so. Hello. <laughs> God doesn't ask you to love Him a lot. And then turn around and beat you and abuse you and treat you poorly. No, 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 no. No, if a husband wants his wife to love him a lot, then he's going to spoil her. He's going to tell her a lot of nice, sweet nothings. He's going to whisper sweet things to her in the bed. He's going to bring her flowers. He's going to buy her candy even if she's a few pounds overweight and probably shouldn't be eating candy anyway. Tommy's giving me dirty looks. You know, uh, a, a husband that wants to be loved and wants to be loved much is going to do things which are going to inspire you to love him. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, God is the same way. The Word of God said it's the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. You know, all this baloney you hear TV preachers preaching, all this garbage you hear preachers preaching about how God is raining down judgment because of the homosexuals. God is raining down judgment because of abortion in America. God is raining down judgment because of uh, gay marriage in America. That is such a pile of manure. You need to throw that garbage away. It is pure garbage. That is pure garbage. First of all, we are today under grace. We're no longer under the law. Therefore, you can't go to the Old Testament when they were under the law and try to apply techniques and methods that God used under the law to those of us in the world today who are under grace. No, God operates under a very different premise today than he did then. And according to the word of God, it is the goodness of God. It is the mercy of God. It is God's long-bearing patience that brings men to repentance, that brings people to the place that they believe in Him and they trust in Him. So God doesn't use beatings to force us to love Him. He tries to woo us. He tries to court us. He tries to entice us, as it were, into a loving relationship with himself. In 1 John 4.19, the Apostle John writes, We love him because he first loved us. Amen. In the Gospel of John 3.16, we all know the passage, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God wants us to love him in response to his first loving us. You cannot love someone and at the same time, listen carefully, not demonstrate that love in some way. Sometimes our spouses, our husbands, our wives, our partners become disappointed with us because we fail to demonstrate our love and our devotion to them. Am I telling the truth? You ever been disappointed in your partner? You ever been disappointed in your husband? Or your wife? Maybe they forgot your anniversary. Or maybe they forgot your birthday. Or maybe they went charging in the store and, and here you were coming out of the rain and you had, ladies, you had to open the door for yourself. Yeah, I may be a gay boy, but I'm still old-fashioned. I hold doors for ladies to this day. That's the way I was raised. That's how a young gentleman's supposed to behave where I come up from. But sometimes we get disappointed in our mates and in our spouses. 
because some way, somehow, they failed to demonstrate their love for us. And it happens every day. It happens in innumerable ways. Sometimes if, if there's one thing Tommy and I go through, and I know some of y'all out there are going to understand what I'm talking about. You've been there. You've had a really rough day and you're going through it and psychologically and emotionally you're kind of really struggling and wrestling and you come in the room and you sit down and you're all quiet and you're all pensive, you know, and you're sitting there and everything and your spouse starts talking to you like everything is grand and everything's fine and there is no problem and you're like, you can't tell! Can't you see that I'm just having a terrible day? Can't you see that I'm not happy? Can't you just tell? Can't you just feel it in the air? You know what I'm talking about? And we're disappointed in our spouse because at that moment, a demonstration of their love for us in our minds would be that they would pick up on our troubled mind and they would pick up on the fact that we're kind of having a heart. Am I telling the truth? So see, we go through these disappointments every day in people that we love and in people that we hope and that we believe love us and we become disappointed because they don't demonstrate their love. I remember thank God with my booby I don't have to worry about this. Tommy is sweet and precious when it comes to uh, things like anniversaries and birthdays and Valentine's Day and all that kind of stuff. But I was in a relationship some years ago for two years with an individual and every day this person made me feel like, to be honest, made me feel like garbage every day. Because every day, in any number of ways, when there was an opportunity for this person to demonstrate that they cared about me, they passed. <laughs> they didn't have time to be bothered with it. And then on special occasions and special events, my birthday came twice while we were together. And twice this person literally absolutely did nothing nothing I, when I say nothing I mean nothing didn't even say happy birthday and you know I'm I'm like it might have been nice if they had got you a card and said something sweet in the card or say you know I didn't have any particular expectation but I certainly had expectations that they were going to demonstrate their caring for me. Do you follow what I'm telling you? In a way better than just acting like my birthday wasn't even my birthday. Same thing happened with Valentine's Day. Same thing happened with Christmas. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm not kidding. This person was terrible. Absolutely terrible. Couldn't have cared less about nothing. When his birthday come up, his 30th birthday, I went and I contacted all his friends and I invited them and I rented out a party room at a local uh, uh, place and uh, man I threw him a big bash and I had a cake and I had all this stuff going on you know and because for me when I care about somebody when I'm enamored with somebody oh honey I'm gonna you're gonna know about it you're going to know about it because I am a demonstrative person. I'm a communicative person. You know, I love, if I love you, honey, I'm going to tell you I love you. If I love you, I'm going to show you I love you because that's just who I am. That's how I am. But don't we all expect that if somebody loves us, that some way, somehow, they're going to demonstrate that love. I, I really want to get this point home because... This is really the point that's being made today in our primary text. In our primary text, we're reading about three men who were given some money when their master, their employer, went out of town for a period of time. Two of those men knew their employer well enough to know that when he comes back, he's... He, 
be a whole lot happier if he has more money than he gave me to begin with. So they exchanged the money, they invested the money, and by the time he got back, they were able to give him double in return what he had given them. But one of the guys did absolutely nothing. He just took the money and he buried it. And when his employer came back, he gave him the money. He said, here you go. Here's what you gave me. And the employer said, you know me. You know me. Isn't it expected that when somebody loves you, they're going to demonstrate their love for you, listen to me now, based on their knowledge of you. Tommy knows my great-grandma, whom I love dearly on my mom's side. Uh, my great-grandmother loved the color yellow. And every time I see yellow flowers, when, when I would go to her grave sometimes and leave flowers, I'd always buy a yellow thing of flowers to leave at her grave, you know, because Grandma loved yellow. And honestly, yellow just exemplified her personality and, and her spirit. She was a yellow person. I mean, she was bright. She was cheerful. She was positive. And so every time I see yellow, I think of... So when Tommy wants to do something for me, and he wants it to kind of be special, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, for birthday or for, uh, 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 yeah, Valentine's Day or whatever the case might be, he'll buy yellow flowers. Why? Because he knows me. Do you follow what I'm telling you? He knows me. He knows, yeah, other people may love red roses. Other people may love this or that or this kind of flower or that kind of flower. But for me, I love anything that puts me in mind of my great-grandma. I love anything that reminds me of her and makes me think about her. So for Valentine's Day this year, he brought me a big old bouquet of, of yellow flowers. Why? Because he knows me. Am I telling the truth? If you've told your spouse a thousand times, I love sunflowers. And every time they bring you flowers, they're bringing you roses or marigolds or something else. You're kind of disappointed. You would expect more from them, wouldn't you? Why? Because they know you. They know your likes. They know your dislikes. That's what this whole... Uh, story is about today that we read. It is about expectations. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? This employer expected something of his employees, listen to me now, even though he did not demand it of them. I hope you're listening carefully to me today. He did not tell them what he wanted them to do with the money when he gave it to them. But that doesn't mean that he did not expect them to do something with it. Do you follow what I'm telling you? When he came back, he was pleased with the first man. He was pleased with the second man. But he was sorely disappointed in the third man because even though the third man knew his employer knew how he thought, knew how he worked. He still did nothing with what he had been given. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, too many Christians in our world today claim to know God. Too many Christians in the world today claim to love the Lord. But they never demonstrate their love for God. They never demonstrate that they have a relationship with God. You never see them do anything, say anything, that would suggest that they really knew who God was and how God is. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. The Lord wants us to love Him. He wants us to demonstrate our love for Him. 
Our spouses may have certain expectations of us, and while they may have never voiced specifically those expectations, they still hope that we care and love them enough to anticipate or to put together things which they would find pleasing. Am I telling the truth? A couple of years ago for Christmas, for instance, to give you a little example, um, Tommy and I had talked over the years and he always said to me, I would love to do one of those Ancestry.com things, you know, so I could find out where exactly my heritage goes back to and, and what nation, nations maybe my people trace back to and what have you. And I wasn't real keen on it. Uh, I won't go into all the reasons, but the companies that do most of these Ancestry things are associated with a major cult here in America. And this particular cult makes money from, you know, you're buying into these kits and everything because uh, they're the ones that, you know, are behind all this. Well, anyhow, so I really was never keen on that idea of doing it simply because I didn't want to give these groups, you know, our money. Well, Christmas came one year and I was trying to think, what could I do for Booby that he would really appreciate and that he would really like and something that would really be meaningful to him and it came into my mind I said you know what I said I'm, I'm just going to bite the bullet on this I said I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to order a Ancestry.com kit so that he can do what he needs to do the little swab thingy you know and send it in and find out his heritage and that's what I gave him for Christmas now now most people if, if you were to give them an Ancestry.com kit they'd look at you like you were half stupid and they think well why in the world would you be giving me an Ancestry.com you know kit for, for a holiday or what have you but see for Tommy it held special meaning because he had expressed to me over the years many times how much he'd love to do that do you follow what I'm telling you now so expressions of love that come from our knowledge of that person we we don't do what we do because he didn't demand that I get him a kid he didn't ask him that I get him a kid he knew that I had uh, reasons for not wanting to really support these organizations uh, but still there was an expectation that I would give him something that meant more than just a board game or something. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Amen. So there are expectations that we have. Even though a demand has not been made, even though no one has said, I want you to do this or I want you to do that, they hope that you're able to put together things which they would find pleasing. How often have we heard the love of our life say, well, I didn't think I had to say it out loud to you. <laughs> oh, am I the only one? Is there anybody out there? Anybody out there you ever had a, your partner had a loved one say, well, I didn't think I had to say it. Because after all, we're supposed to be mind readers. You know, we're supposed to have BSP. I didn't think I had to say it. Well, that's because in a certain situation, they expected that we would respond a certain way. The way they need us to respond. Based upon our knowledge of them, their needs, and their desires. Now, here's what's interesting. In Matthew 25, the Lord begins with this lengthy parable about, about expectations without demands. There were no demands made by the employer, but there was still an expectation. Then the very next passage, verses 31 through 46 goes on to a whole new area. 
And the Lord said, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall uh, set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison. And ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, meaning an immigrant, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Listen, Verily I say unto you, in so much, in as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. I've been talking about expectations without demands. His first parable talks about expectations in absence of demands. The very next parable he speaks in the same chapter, he talks about things that people do, charitable things, kind things, generous things. And he says, when you do these things for anyone else, you're doing it as if you're doing it for me. Take a wild guess at what the Lord might expect of us. See, He doesn't tell you. He doesn't say, visit the sick. Go to prison and offer comfort to those who are in prison. Do this, do that. He doesn't say that. First He says, you know, here, you know, here's a situation where a guy knows what's expected of him because he knows the person he's dealing with and yet he still doesn't do it. He said, And then he says, now, now here's a story about people who do kind and generous and loving things and how when they do these things for even the least, in other words, you know, you're not, you don't just go visit the queen when she's in the hospital's sick, but you go in when the poorest member of your church is sick. So when you do it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Ah, oh, wait, ah, oh, I see, okay. Do you get it? Do you see how putting the pieces of the puzzle together has, there's a message in that? Many lessons are often lost as we read from our Bibles. One of the greatest truths we seldom see when reading the parable of the unprofitable servant is the Lord never owes anyone anything. Now there, you read the, the primary text we read today. One of the biggest lessons in that story is, listen to me, God never owes anybody anything. Say, how do you get that from the parable of the unprofitable servant. Um, who did he give the money to after the men had doubled their investment, after they had doubled the money that he had given them to hold? He gave the money to the men who had doubled it. Am I telling the truth? When it come time to take the penny away from the one man, the talent away from the one man, who did he give it to? He gave it to the guy that had the most. He said, because those that have more will be given more. So those that don't have, it'll be taken away. Oh my goodness. What is he telling us? He's saying, when you do good, 
when you act charitably, when you act kindly, when you behave like somebody who loves God, you're doing things for people, but in the process of doing them for people, it's as if you're doing it for me personally. Therefore, if we're going to demonstrate our love for God, how do we do that? We do it by reason of our conduct toward others. Who? The sick. Those who are in prison. Those who are immigrants. Those who are strangers. We help people that need help. Am I telling the truth? The Lord said, when you do it unto these, you do it unto me. Interestingly enough, many focus on the punishment given to the unprofitable servant. But what about the rewards made to those who did show a profit? A careless reading of the 25th chapter of Matthew fails to see three main points in the chapter. Point number one, verses 1 through 13. It is the story of the ten virgins. The Lord will return at an unknown hour, so be ready. Point number two, verses 14 through 30. The unprofitable servant. The Lord has expectations of us even though he does not frame them as demands or edicts. And thirdly, point number three, verses 31 through 46, the story of the sheep and the goats, the expectations the Lord has of those who claim to love him. If you want to know what his expectations are, read verses 31 through 46. That's how the Lord expects a Christian to act. That's how God expects the believer to behave. How many Christians behave like that? 1 John 4, 16-19, almost done. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is... So are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him, because he first loved us. Mm -hmm. Children, I'm trying to bring it to a close right now. God has expectations of his people. He does expect something from us. He doesn't demand it. He doesn't articulate it in such a way as to make it a commandment or a demand. But He articulates it in such a way so that we understand, that, wait a minute, if I do these things, the Lord said it's like I'm doing it up to Him. Well, honey, how much, how much more does He have to say? Therefore, if I'm going to show my love for God, I do so by feeding the poor. I do so or by feeding the hungry. I do so by clothing those that need clothes. I do so by being kind to the stranger. I do so by being compassionate to those in prison. I do so by visiting those who are in hospitals. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But here's the sad thing, Tommy. We've got Christians in the world today who run around following after preachers who tell them they can be rich and they can can have wealth and they can have prosperity. They can have jewels and diamonds and Lincolns and Rolls and mansions and yachts. Oh, it's all about what they can have, but where in that are they instructing God's people as to God's expectations of them? One of the things about the Riverside Church of God when I came to Fort Worth, Texas, that I absolutely loved. Now the church I grew up in was pretty good about things like this. They really were. But Riverside almost took it to an extreme. If somebody was in the hospital, the saints would go visit him in the hospital. They'd have people coming to see him in the hospital. People from the church would be coming through to see him. If you were 
at home sick or if you miss church for whatever reason for a while, folks from the church would come by the house and visit you. You know, they'd spend a little time with you. If somebody was in jail, folks from the church would go visit. And it didn't have to be one of their church members. It could be the son of a church member. It could be the daughter of a church member. It could be the grandson or, you know. And But they constantly, constantly, the people of Riverside constantly were demonstrating their love for God by reason of their conduct. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And oh, I'm going to tell you, I watched it and I saw it. Riverside had a number of nursing home ministries. They sent out teams to about four different nursing homes every single Sunday. They had teams that went out. They had people that played instruments. They had people that led singing. They had somebody that would deliver a little word of inspiration and encouragement. And they had uh, people who, uh, if uh, people were in the nursing home, you'd go see them in the nursing home. Now, Tommy can tell you, I'm old-fashioned. I believe a Christian ought to act like a Christian. I've known people, family and otherwise, who have been in the hospital. And when I found out they were in the hospital, even in Fort Worth, which from Dallas is about 35 miles or so, I told Tommy, I said, i got to go to see them in the hospital. I had a great uncle who... Uh, for a while was going through some serious health issues and he wound up in a nursing home. And I told Tommy, I said, I've got to go see my uncle in the nursing home. So he and I went a couple of times and visited with my uncle in the nursing home. Uh, when people are in a hospital, I've had uh, church members tell me, well, you know, my brother is in the hospital. And the first thing I ask him is, well, what room is he in? What hospital is he in? One of our church members online, you know, our, our ministry locally is very small but we have a large internet following and there are some people uh, who follow us online who have been with us for years and years and years and a couple of them are even financially supportive only a couple but there are a couple who are financially supportive of our work and uh, one gal had posted on Facebook that her husband had a very serious issue that came upon him in the last uh, week or so when he was in the hospital she was asking for prayer and when Tommy told me about it I, I immediately of course began to pray and then Tommy went to go to the gym and immediately I, be, I got on my computer and I began to look for airfare to Kansas City and I sent her a message on my phone because we also communicate by text a lot of our Internet ministry people communicate with me also by text on the phone if they have questions or if they're going through something or if they have a prayer request. So I send her a message and I said, you know, well, what hospital is the in and all? And because immediately, folks, I was making arrangements to go see them, to go see them and pray with them. I don't believe in love that talks. I believe in love that walks. I don't believe in Christianity that talks a good talk. I believe in Christianity that walks when it talks. And Tommy can tell you there have been any number of times he's had co-workers at his job and they've had the death of a loved one, you know, whether it be their mother, their dad, their um, uh, their spouse and I've said to him well are you going to go to the funeral or are you going to go to the wake you know Tommy didn't grow up the way I grew up he didn't he doesn't have the same church background I've got and he'll look at me sometimes and say well why and I'd say because this is an opportunity for you to demonstrate your faith this is an opportunity for you to demonstrate your love for God do you hear what I'm telling you oh children I won't tell you if God's people would live like God's people are called to live our world would be a very different place the problem is we got too many Christians looking to be rich and spending all their time at their jobs and you know what they never take time out to go visit somebody in a the hospital they never take time out to go see a church member or a friend or or a friend of a friend or a family member of a family member who might be in a nursing home. You see, this is what we're called to do. Not because God commands us, not because He demands this of us, but because He has great expectations of us. 
And he's articulated what he likes. He's articulated what impresses him. He's articulated what he appreciates. And we'd be foolish, unprofitable servants if we took that information, hello now, and didn't do something with it. If we just sit on it, okay, Lord, I know that you like it when your people do this and do that, and they visit the sick, and they help people who are hungry, and they help people who are naked. Blah, 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 blah. I know you've said all that, Lord, uh, but I'm just going to sit here and sit on it, and I'm not going to do any of it. Hello now. Oh, children, I want to tell you, God has great expectations. Very few people get married, and this is my closing statement. Very few people get married. And when you're standing in the altar, you're standing at the front of the church getting married, very few people are sitting there thinking of themselves, oh, I'm looking forward to years, decades of arguing and fighting and kicking each other and screaming and being mad because he never did anything to show he loved me. He never did anything to show he cared about me. I'm just looking forward to all the arguments we're going to have because she never demonstrated. No, 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 no. Now, when we're standing there at that altar, we've got all kinds of sweet dreams, haven't we? We've got all kinds of expectations in our mind of good things to come. I'm here to tell you today, for God concerning His people, He has great expectations. And He has told us what those expectations are. He doesn't command us, but He's given us the information. And now, it's in our court what we do with it. Amen. Amen. If you'd stand with me this afternoon. I